Will you look at that? I knew that was going to happen. Those guys came and, and they asked me to use this upper room, and I didn't have a good feeling about that. They were crude, completely without any sophistication whatsoever. They were Galileans, I could tell by their accent. They wanted to use my upper room. Huh. Look at the mess they left. I normally wouldn't let this, this room out. I mean, after all, the Jewish Passover begins tomorrow. This city is going to be absolutely packed with people. Every room will be taken. But they said the master needs it. So I asked them, who's your master? They told me. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Ah, the light came on. I remember hearing about him. I have a, I have a brother-in-law up in Cana. It's in Galilee. It's not too far from Nazareth, actually. He told me, he told me that he was at a wedding one day. And that the wedding ran out of wine. What an embarrassment for the host. But they went to this Jesus. And, and this Jesus turned many, many gallons of water into wine. I don't always believe my brother-in-law. He has a habit of enjoying that wine, too. <laughs> but said that about a year ago he had been just outside the temple at a pool we call Bethesda. It's one of those pools that stirs up every now and then and when it does people who are lame, who are ill, they can get into that water and they'll be healed. They told me that there was a man who had been sitting there for many years, 30 some years. And Jesus came by. But Jesus didn't put him in the water. This Jesus just said, get up and walk. And he did. And then, and then there's that story that gets told over and over again around here. Oh, it's a great story. There was a man born blind. And, and Jesus healed him. And, and nobody believed it. His neighbors said, well, he looks like the man that was blind, but I don't think so. The religious leaders, they said, they said, who did it? The Jesus of Nazareth. Who's that? I don't know. They questioned his parents. They questioned the man again. They, they finally kicked him out of the synagogue. They didn't want anything to do with him. Oh, and then, then just a few days ago, in a little town real near here, a place called Bethany, a man died there. And they put him in the grave, and he was there for four days when this Jesus came. Four days in the grave. And they rolled the stone away, and Jesus had him come out, and he healed him. Dead for four days. So naturally, I'm a little curious. I thought, well, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad deal to have, to have this Jesus sitting at this table in my upper room. So I gave in to his followers. <laughs> See what he got me? Galileans. I bet they were fishermen. Well, anyhow, they came together here. They sat around this table. And I told you they were unrefined. They didn't even bother to wash anyone's feet. That's, that's basic hospitality. They, but they didn't do it. So they're eating their meal, and the teacher gets up from down at the end of the table and gets a basin of water and a towel and starts washing their feet. Oh, I bet that was embarrassing. I bet they didn't like that. 
Oh, and look at this. They left the basin here. What am I going to do with a bowl full of dirty feet water? teacher were, were troubled somehow. And he started talking about what it meant to be one of his followers, one of his disciples. And he talked a lot about taking care of one another and seeing to one another's needs and being there for people. Love was the word he used. I give you a new commandment, he said. That you love one another. Well, I thought to myself, that's not new. I mean, our scriptures, what we call the Torah, <coughs> that teaches us to love. Love your neighbor as yourself. What seemed to be different here was the way in which he spoke. It was almost as if those ancient scriptures were coming from him. He told them that the people would know that, that they were his disciples if they showed this kind of love for one another, this caring, this compassion. It, this was pretty radical stuff, you know? Oh, not radical like those zealots that come up every once in a while. Those nuts that want to want to get an army together and go out and kill all the Roman soldiers with swords and spears. No, not like that. This one talked about if anything, loving them to death. Then he had, then he had lots of other things to say as well. He talked a lot about going away, going away. Hmm. Oh, look at this! Look at the stains on this. I'm good. This is going to have. All these are going to have to be washed before tomorrow. And, and my wife's off in another town taking care of her mother. <laughs> I don't know, what a time for her to leave. Busy. He talked about going away. Talked a lot about going away from them. But, but with a word of hope. At one point he said, I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you can be there too. And so he said, don't be troubled. Don't be worried. Besides that, he told them, I'm going to send you one that will, will help you. A comforter, an advocate, he called it. One that will come and, and remind you of all of the things that I've said. Will give you some direction. Will, will be the power in your life. Seems like he really loved this group even though they weren't good. Oh, and this bread. He said something about bread. I wasn't here, there to hear it. But I know that he said something about the bread and the wine they were drinking. It, it was as, as if somehow they were, he was changing this meal into something significant, something important, something that would help them remember. 
But he continued with his talk of going away, and then there were words that really bothered me. I heard him talk about betrayal. I heard him talk about being denied. It didn't sound good at all. Then he prayed for me. Oh, he prayed for me. It was a long prayer. But you could tell that he was praying to the Lord that, that these would be taken care of. And in the course of that prayer, he said things. He said things that religious authorities would be hor horrified at. He said he and the Father were one. He prayed as if he had such an intimate relationship with the Lord. The two of them were one. They call that blasphemy in some places. But you know, now that I think about it, as I think about the stories told about him, as I listen to the words that he said, he really does reflect this God that we worship. Our ancient scriptures tell us that this God is merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's what I see in this Jesus. Maybe he and the Father are one. I hope they remember these Galileans, these fishermen. I hope they remember this. Oh, God. Got one more gear. I have to take this yet. You know, I don't really have room for it. I, I think I'll leave this here. Maybe someone else can use it. Maybe, maybe, maybe it will remind someone else about this, about this teacher, this Jesus. As I think about it, I don't have a very good feeling about the rest of this night. I don't think things are going to go very well for him. And it worries me. You know, the words he spoke were powerful. I hope they remember. Love. That's what he said. Love one another. It was at the heart of everything he proclaimed at this table today. Love. I wonder where that love is going to take you. I hope they remember. I hope they remember all his teachings. 